Greetings, friends and fellow makers. A friend of mine gave me this big ring gear. I think he got it from a bulldozer or something. I thought it would be interesting to make something with it. It's about uh, a foot in diameter. And it's steel. I know that much. Well, let's give it a test uh, malleability. And our file says that it is machinable. So I'll be able to drill it, tap it, weld it, slap it, whatever. The hardest part is thinking what to make with it. I was thinking about like a spider, but I don't know. That's the tough part. I do like steampunk art. That's one of the things that I enjoy doing. It's repurposing this stuff into this kind of stuff. And I have whole boxes full of gizmos and gears and things of that nature to help out. Uh, not that, but let's see. Here's an idea. How about a wall clock? It's just about the right size. I think that would work. I'll get myself a uh, little steam valve handle for the hub. And the clock movement will go behind that. And then I could add some accoutrement of the steampunk genre to kind of make this thing uh, unique. Yeah, it's coming. Let's see. Got some other bits here. Let's get an idea. Well, I got these brass valves, and I think they'll shine up nicely. And I think the idea is to put these highlight pieces at the uh, cardinal points of the clock. You know, 6, 12, 3, and 9. I don't know what I'll put for the other clock points, if any. I mean, I want this to be a functional clock, even though it is decorative. I'll think of something. So yeah, this is off to a decent start. And it's not going to be too heavy of a piece, so hanging on the wall will be pretty good. All right. So that's basically it. And I found something that would probably work well. It's three quarter inch shaft. And uh, it's only 10 bucks. Battery operated quartz drive clock movement. And it's just about the right size for this project. The one thing that I have to get past is this gear is really coated with rust on the outside, on the inside ring. That's just a lot of work to uh, get all of this rust off of that and also the valve handle. So I'll go to my old standby. In the white bucket I have some Wasser. It's just basically tap water and to that I add sodium carbonate or washing soda. Not to be confused with sodium bicarbonate which is baking soda. One tablespoon per gallon of water. I have five gallons of water here. And what this does, it makes an electrolytic action in the water. Um, and it allows current to flow through the anodes. And the negative portion of the charge is attached to the workpiece. And it 
converts the rust by taking a molecule from the iron oxide and basically what it does it turns it into a hydrogen molecule and it releases it from the base metal yeah it's a pretty interesting process uh, I use this on a uh, statue an iron cast iron statue that my wife bought it came out beautiful it's in my videos so into the large bucket where I added the solution I put the workpiece that's also connected with copper wire those two anodes on the side are connected with the copper wire but they have to be all separated you can't have the workpiece touching the anodes you'll short circuit everything and it won't work I'll attach the negative lead to the workpiece which is the copper wires that are holding the two pieces together and then I'll attach the positive lead to the copper wire that holds the anodes which are submerged in the solution. Now for power I use a scrapped power supply from a desktop computer. I put all the 12 volt leads together and all the grounds together. Well, I'm sorry, 6 volt leads and I have 6 volts DC flown at about 6 amps. So once that gets going and the electric pixies do their thing, it flows through the anodes, through the solution, and through the workpiece. And here you can see almost instantaneously it starts doing its thing. You can see the uh, electrolysis starting to work. This process takes a little bit of time. It's about one hour, and you can see the rust floating to the top right I'd say about three hours this should be done maybe four we'll see in the meantime what I'll do is I polished up these accent pieces and they uh, came out really nice so we're moving right along as they say It's been about four hours, three and a half, four hours, I don't know. And we're ready to take this out. Now, one thing I can't stress enough, you're dealing with electricity and water here. So make sure you unplug your power supply before you start messing with this stuff. Because you don't want to uh, hit the anodes and short everything out. Let's be safe. So take this out it's looking pretty good I just get this all untied here and I just learned something interesting about the steam valve handle which I'll get to in a moment now you can see all the rust is off the piece and is floating around on top of the water there And uh, like I said, it does a does a really good job, and it just saves a lot of handwork. You know, now there's nothing but a quick whisking and drying up, and it'll look just fine. All right, got it untangled here, and I'll give you a close up so you can see. Now the pitting that the rust may have caused, any any pitting, that's still going to be there. This is not going to take the pits out. So this gear is more pitted on one side than it is on the other. The side that will be facing out is a better side, of course. But you can just see right from here that uh, the rust is gone and on the inside of the ring look at that that was my biggest concern it was pretty rusty in on the inside 
nice and clean now. Now there's a couple of gear teeth that you might see some rust in them. You just take a wire brush on that and that stuff comes right off. I mean just it's just residual there. The rust is no longer attached to the metal. See? Yeah. That came out nice. That was just about three hours for that piece. Now on this handle, one of the things I've discovered is that wasn't rust. It's a rust colored paint. Uh, that was interesting. Now this won't take paint off, um, but uh, a wire wheel will take the paint off. So now we just have to get rid of the schmoo. Some old timers say it's good in the garden. All of that iron oxide. I don't know enough about those things to comment one way or the other. I just dump it out in the gravel. So here we are. Now our base hardware is all cleaned up. Nice and purdy. Shining up like a new penny, they say. So now we'll start thinking of how we're going to throw this thing all together. Got some ideas. On my work table, I laid out a uh, circle and used a protractor to get the cardinal and alternate points. And I'll just transcribe them onto the gear to get a location. And I've done that and I've gotten the center line of the ring thickness and use a center punch off to the drill press. Now the drilling was a little surprising. Um, I found that the uh, face of the gear teeth, the gear teeth side of this piece was case hardened. So the drilling and the tapping wasn't as easy as I thought it would be, but it was an impossible. Um, drilling uh, small holes, uh, 1024 thread for the ordinary points and um, drilling for a 1 8 NPT national pipe thread for the fittings that are going to go on the cardinal points. And that's a much larger drill because NPT deals with the ID of the pipe. So here's my holes. I want to just take a moment here and let anybody know if you're going to mess around with this steampunk stuff and you're going to be using fittings and gauges and whatnot. I mean, this is a 1024 screw. It's a normal thread, normal tap. Um, but the pipe threads are different. The pipe threads are tapered. This is just a straight screw. And it uses just a regular tap where the national pipe thread or NPT taps are quite different. They go by the ID size of the hole, which is 1 8 and you can see the fitting is tapered. It's an odd thread. It's 27 threads per inch. And you use a special tap for that. It's a specially made tap. You can see the tap itself is tapered. Which is why it's a good idea to follow up your drilled holes with a appropriately sized tapered reamer. That'll give you that... Uh, matching taper. So that's just a thought if you guys want to get involved in this stuff it's probably good to pick up those special tooling. Alright so my clock movement came in today. It's just basic quartz clock movement. It uses a standard AA battery 
when it stops working you change the battery um, it's, it's what I expected now I'm gonna mount this I found a uh, plumbing strap pipe holder off of one of the jobs and I just like the holes in it I think it's pretty neat so I'm going to mount that kinda of like this I had to do a little bending because I want the back of the clock movement flush with the whole piece I don't want that sticking out by itself so I made uh, a bend to to get it recessed in there and that works out real well it'll be nice and flush so this will, I'll screw on to the back that's another couple of holes I have to drill and tap yay but I'll uh, fasten that kinda like that now the steam valve handle I had to modify the bottom of the hub a bit I had to take it to the belt sander and take about an eighth of an inch off of it because it was sitting too proud and it would stop the hour hand from moving the hour hand would interfere with it so now everything's good and the hour hand clears it by a good eighth of an inch which is what I want onward and upward After I get things assembled, all my metal projects I always lacquer the front and the back. I give a couple of coats of a satin finish. Gloss finish looks horrible on metal. Um, it's important to keep it from oxidizing. Now one of the things I was thinking of doing was putting some piping in this. You run pipe here, there, and but uh, I just thought it would be too busy. I'll show you in a sec. So here's a finished piece. Like I said, it doesn't look too busy with less stuff in the middle there. It also casts a nice shadow on the wall. You can see the gear teeth depending on which way the light's coming from. And it keeps good time. The minute hand is moving in one minute intervals. Yeah, this was a fun project to make. So thanks for tuning in and make something yourself. Bye.